so okay, so you just looked at the east-west comparison chart of technological inventions and such comparing China and, and the West. And the only point for you to get in that overwhelming chart is that China was normally at least a thousand, at least ten centuries ahead, sometimes twenty centuries ahead of the West in its inventions. Things that we didn't talk about in the Han Dynasty, they invented paper in the Han Dynasty, paper, right? The Egyptians are using like, uh, what's that stuff called in Egypt? Huh? Papyrus. Papyrus, yeah, and then we're using vellum, which is lambskin and all sorts of stuff. The Chinese went from bamboo, writing on bamboo or silk during the, the Zhou and the, well, the Zhou and the Qin, to writing on paper. They invented paper in the, in the Han. A Western Renaissance thinker said that the rise of the West was due to four inventions, paper, gunpowder, the compass, and the printing press. That is how the West conquered. Guess who invented paper, gunpowder, the compass, and the printing press? Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before the West, China. When we talk about the Chinese as a backwards place because they happen to have had a bad little spell of about 150 years before Mao took control, we have no idea how just completely idiotic we are. They were by far the most advanced civilization on the planet for most of their history except for the past 200 years. Anyway, so I hope you see that. This is, I love this unit, but I hate this semester thing. So you're going to have to just accept the fact that Wave three, I'm going to try to get through it in a day. Now, if you think of filmmaking, sometimes you do close-ups. Let's, like, look at So Rob's nose, right? We're going to, like, really, like, get into the details. And then we're going to, like, look at his left eye and then his right eye, right? Close-ups. Sometimes you, you, you zoom out and you'll do a medium shot where it's still some detail. And then sometimes you will do a wide shot. This is a wide-angle look at, get ready, 700 years of the entirety of wave three. So it's going to be an outline, okay? I hope you understand that you will be taking courses in college where you go into this stuff deep. I am, I am, among other things, trying to seduce you into saying, if I have to study a particular history in college, God, that one was interesting, and I know there's so much more than I got in high school. This one's really interesting. This one's really cool. So here it is in the long view. Before I start, I'm going to tell you, this is the, the wedding cake of Chinese history, the five waves wedding cake. We've gone through the first wave, the Shang and the Zhou. What did the Shang and the Zhou leave as like, or you could picture it as a building, right? Floors. So the ground floor or the foundation, the, the values, family and that sort of thing, right? Ritual, that sort of thing. And then the philosophy. That's what, that's what the Shang and Zhou left us. What did the second wave, Qin and Han, leave us? The political foundation, a centralized bureaucracy with scholar officials on top. That sticks and that stays. So notice we have got now our, our values, our philosophy, and our political, and because of Wu Di and the Silk Road, and uh, I'm sorry, not the Silk Road, the, the Sheng Nu and all that sort of thing, and him having to like garrison the, the Great Wall, that agrarian base that he settled. So economically, China is cemented that way. So that's why wave two, really its legacies are, this brilliant political system where you've got humane officials on top, not legalist assholes, pardon my French. And then, so here we are in wave three. The only thing left, what's, what's missing from this picture of a civilization? The culture. So now we've got the culture, and the culture really explodes here. Well, China developed all of these things, and so now here is like the cherry on top to complete the civilization. Wave four, the Ming and the Qing, they don't really change what has been accumulated through wave three. This, this completes the picture. I do want you to take notes. Are, we, are you ready? I think, my, I think my question for you will be something as simple as this. For your final exam, what are the most interesting things that you want to remember for your webcam that has to like hit all the waves, right? So what are the most interesting things that, uh, that you might want to hit from wave three? Because here's wave three in a nutshell. Correct me if I'm wrong, we talked about the sway last time. We talked about the Grand Canal. We talked about the, the civil service examination, yes? And we talked about the centralized government, right? 
And then we talked, did we talk, and we talked about, I remember because Edith knew who high, we talked about his jerk of a son. Because they were overthrown because the son was pleasure palace, pleasure boating with, with uh, turned out to be something like 40,000 people he had on these barges on the people's dime, the taxpayer's dime. He's having parties for 40,000 of his homies at the Sentosa, right? Um, it's nice to spend the peasants' money. So the Tang takes over. Now, the founder was uh, the Emperor Gaozu, G-A-O-Z-U. I don't want to overwhelm you with this stuff, but the interesting story here is his son Taizong. Did we talk about his son Taizong? And how his son Taizong killed his brothers, and I was, I was reading some more on it uh, since I saw you. He didn't only kill his brothers, he killed his brother's sons. He wiped out every possible claimant to the throne. Now, who was saying, oh, I think he was probably a nice guy? Okay, I, I rest my case, right? I'm killing my nephews, not just my brother. And his wife was uh, named Empress Wu. And I think we did even get to the fact that she was the only empress in Chinese history. Do we get to that fact? No, no? okay. We won't really go there too, too much. But, the, um, but again, the interesting thing about Taizong is that despite this just blood-covered seizure of power, once he took it, he went down in Chinese history as the Wu Di, basically, of the Tang. He ruled for about 40 years, and he really did set the Tang up to be this splendid cosmopolitan and, and golden age of Chinese history. His wife was a concubine who worked her way up the ranks. Uh, he married her. When he died, she started doing this inner court stuff that we talked about. Remember the queens and the concubines and all that sort of thing? I won't go into whose son she killed and who she poisoned and which concubines she had thrown down wells and drowned. I won't go through any of that. Um, you can see that stuff on TV dramas because they love this woman. She's just like, good God, Shakespeare, had he known about her, he'd be like, I'm going to write like 10 tragedies on her and maybe a couple of comedies too because, God, that's just a wild story. In any case, she ends up getting her son Xuanzang on the throne. No, I'll back up. I'll back up. This is a Buddhist empire. Let me show you the, the recent Harvard series of histories on China. They're doing it per dynasty. So here's the, the Tang's history published in the last five years. Look at the cover and tell me what you see. Anybody know what? The, you've seen these buildings. Do you know what they're called? This, this kind of architecture? Pagoda? Yeah, it's a pagoda. And a pagoda is what? It came from what civilization? India. India. Pagoda is an Indian Buddhist uh, architectural style. And the Tang Dynasty has pagodas all over the place because the Tang was a Buddhist civilization. Now look at the next, look at the next one. Compare and contrast. It's, it's a really nice thing that they did. We're going to write about the Tang and the Song. And so we go, so what does that show us? That we have gone from a, a Tang, Buddhist-dominated culture where Confucianism is, is below Tang. When the Song came in, there was a Confucian resurgence and, and Buddhism never, uh, never recovered. And so it will be Confucian from now on. So this Tang thing, this, this, this Buddhism thing, it's only the Tang dynasty that Buddhism uh, is really, really dominant. That's why I had to add that there. So Taizong's biggest goal was to restore the glory of the Han dynasty. The Han Dynasty, like the Roman Empire, right? This was our glorious classical empire. And the Tang is like, OK, the Sui reunited, but we still, we're still smaller than the Han was. And so we need to reunify and include everything in the Han territory into Tang territory. What does that mean? That means the Silk Road. So the Silk Road is back. Remember, the northern barbarians took the Yellow River, and that means they took the Silk Road. The Silk Road is back all the way down to Vietnam. And so they are as big as, as the Han again. Through the Silk Road comes traders. Through the Silk Road comes religious people. 
by the time of this Emperor Xuanzang, and that's, I don't care if you know the names, I'm just giving you the names if you, if, if, for whatever reason. By the time of Xuanzang, the capital city is, again, the, the words you constantly hear, cosmopolitan, which means international, and splendid, which is just the most bizarre adjective for uh, a grown-up to throw at something. The splendor of the tongue. I'm not a man who uses the word splendor, and I'm sure most of these writers aren't either, but sometimes you're just looking for the word that really does justice to just how magnificent a civilization is, and it's the tongue. And I have the word tolerant here. Now, I don't know what I've given you, and I'm going through it fast, so it's, if I've given it to you already, I'm just repeating and reviewing. The word tolerant. Coming into trade via the Silk Road, which came into the Wei River Valley in Chang'an, the capital of the Tang, were people from all the different civilizations of Central and West Asia, including Persians who had a religion called, they had two, they had Zoroastrianism and they had, what's the other one? It was a Manichaeanism, doesn't matter, two Persian religions. Islam came in because Allah revealed his divine word to Muhammad in 622. Right when the Tong started, that's when Islam starts. And so the Muslims, you know this, right? They, within one generation, they just like exploded out of Arabia and they conquered so much of North Africa and, and over into India. And Muslims therefore come in and they bring their, their uh, mosques into China. You have Christians from the old Byzantine Empire area, that would be Syria and, and Iraq, these areas. So you have Christians in the Tang capital. You have Jews in the Tang capital. And so in the Tang capital, there are maps that show where the temples of all of these, every single religion that existed, Hindu, Buddhist, Taoist, Confucian, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, all in the capital city of China. And the Tang emperors were like, you be you, right? Non-coercive action. We're not going to force you not to worship anything. Incredibly tolerant. Cosmopolitan International, not only did they bring their religion, they brought their fashions. They brought their musical instruments. This was the Paris or the New York of the medieval world. And so under this Emperor Xuanzang, who was lucky enough to like come in after his, his I guess, granddad Taizong um, had, had done everything to set the foundations for a, um, a successful dynasty, he just becomes like the Queen Elizabeth. Let me, let me educate you if you don't know what that means. What is, what is Queen Elizabeth known for culturally in England? She's known for something, absolutely. Who did Shakespeare dedicate so many of his plays to? Right? She surrounded herself with Shakespeare, with Marvel, with so many of the, of the English poets, right? The English Renaissance. That happened around Queen Elizabeth, who patronized it, who sponsored it, who supported it. Yeah, we're talking culture. I know we're a post-cultural age. Um, well, in the same way, this guy, his court was surrounded with the great painters, the great lyric poets. This is the golden age of lyric poetry in China. What is lyric poetry? Songs have lyrics, short poems. China's lyric poets from the Tang are the Shakespeare's to China. You can go to YouTube and you can see four-year-old girls in Hong Kong reciting Tang poets. Porcelain, China, who cares? This is the biggest good luck, bad luck thing in the world. China happens to have the minerals and the resources naturally to create not ceramic clay pots, those aren't particularly pretty, not like porcelain, which has this glaze and this shine. This is the, this is the, the, the shiny <coughs> Ferrari, right, of, uh, of the pre-car world, to own fine porcelain. It, it was the, the most desired product that China produced. Good luck, bad luck. Everybody wanted to buy it and it ends up the British end up wanting to buy it too. And we know where how, well maybe you know how that ended. So porcelain gets its start here. It's another thing they invented. Music, again, world music. They now have music, musical instruments, particularly from the Persians and the Turks. And so Chinese music mixing with Persian and Turkish um, and Muslim uh, types of rhythms and melodies and instruments and such, and so their music is really interesting. 
the capital city, Chang'an, cosmopolitan. I have elegant, elegant because the fashions, the fashions that came in, the, the elites in the capital city, they were like, I don't know, maybe like we are when we go to New York and we're like, look at all the diverse fashions. Let's do some fusion stuff. Let's start combining hairstyles of this and clothes of that and all that sort of thing. And so um, it was a fashionable city. It was elegant and it was fun. Fun, the streets were full of acrobats. So Chinese acrobats that, how many of you have seen a Chinese acrobat show? Oh, God. Oh, God. If you, and how many of you thought, okay, you know, that was a pretty cool show. If you didn't, you saw the wrong show. And dance. Have you seen the, the Chinese dancers with the long, long sleeves that they can do this, right? And the sleeves go out like to hit Tanya in the nose, right? Also playing daggers and her Okay. Uh, so that is, a, that is a Turkish dance that the Chinese, um, bar, that, that whole, fashion thing is a, again, it's a product of the whole cosmopolitan international city of the Tang because of the Silk Road coming into their capital. The last thing to say about uh, the Tang, maybe I said it already, women in Tang, and if you were to flip through here, you would see paintings or statues of women, little porcelain statues of women on horseback. Did I tell you this? Women on horseback, not properly on horseback, side saddle, but who in the hell no? On horseback, man style, playing polo, which is a sport that was brought in from the Central Asians. Horseback polo, and women are playing it, and the women were plump. And the artists are choosing to, to make statues, representations of women who are plump, strong. They have like triple chins, these women. They have really, really fleshy, fleshy forms, right? And they're playing polo. They're owning businesses. This is the high point of, of feminism in Chinese history until the communists come and make women equal. Um, so the women are free, the women are plump. And they're playing polo on horseback like men, with men. The last thing to say about the Tang Dynasty. Next to last thing. I said it was Buddhism. Another thing that kills me about how little we give credit to China, oh, they're backwards, and oh, Buddhism. Well, Zen Buddhism is cooler than Chinese Buddhism. Hello, Zen Buddhism is just the Japanese word for Chan Buddhism, which came from China. During the Tang Dynasty, not only did they have these Silk Road people, they also had Koreans and Japanese who came to this world-famous city because of this splendid civilization. The Koreans and the Japanese come into China, and only now do they start writing only now, 1,400 years ago, do they start writing. We have done about 2,100 years of China. And now the Koreans and the Japanese start entering history and taking Confucianism and Taoism. Look at the Korean flag. You'll see the, the six-lined the, the six lined hexagrams around the yin-yang symbol of the Korean flag, that's all Chinese symbology, right? Korea got it from China. Japan got it from China. Japan's capital city in, in uh, Kyoto is modeled on the Tang capital city. Everything Chinese uh, was taken away from the Japanese and the, by the Japanese and the Koreans back, and they were like, let's do this. The Confucianism, the, the, the government, everything. Of course, it blended with the samurai culture into some very interesting things. You've got Taoists and Confucians who are both like, don't force anything and all that sort of thing, and the, the samurai, right? How did that work? So in China, another form of Buddhism was this Chan Buddhism, which became Zen in China. They were interesting people. They were the ones who, these Buddhist monks in the Shaolin Monastery, anybody heard of the Shaolin Monastery? Yeah, uh, yeah I've been there like twice. Um, and it's a cool place, is it not? <laughs> Did you see the performance? Um, yeah, we saw it Yeah. Um, so this is where these monks in the Tang Dynasty would meditate for their enlightenment, and they would drink tea as a stimulant to keep them awake when they meditated. Tea was not China's national drink yet. So it's thanks to Chan Buddhists that tea started being drank, and then Elites would go to the monasteries and they would see these Buddhists, these monks drinking tea, and they would be like, well, that's an interesting beverage. 
And so tea culture gets its start here. These guys also, because they had to fight invaders, um, they had to be able to defend their monastery, they developed the martial art called Kung Fu to the Westerners. So Bruce Lee, who does he have to thank for his film career? The Tang Dynasty and the Chan Buddhists, monks in a monastery practicing martial arts and Kung Fu, Gong Fu. And it all comes to a screaming end because the Queen Elizabeth figure, the, the cultured emperor, this man painted. He, he, he's actually in the, the art history books as a painter, this, this emperor. Um, although there are questions whether somebody else painted them for him. But um, he fell in love with a woman, a concubine named Yang Fei. another concubine. And so here we are. Now, I've given you pivot points. And I will expect you, well, all of you, I will expect you to like go, okay, so why this pivot point here? Again, remember, we talked pivots. This is the key to like being able to pass any quiz. Turning points happen wherever the timeline pivots. Well, so the sway we see it rise and then we see the Tong take over and things are just going swimmingly until 756 when this Emperor Shu uh, Xuanzang, who's got all the great lyric poets, all the great philosophers, all the great painters, all the great musicians, all the great dancers, all the great artists of his age, making his capital city this magnificent thing, the Paris of the Middle Ages, biggest city in the world, becomes just way too enamored of this concubine who's gorgeous. And um, yep, here we, here we go. Totally King Yu. And he starts, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's totally King Yo, <laughs> which I've called you a million times, but that OU sound is an O sound in Chinese. Um, but luckily, it always is in Pinyin. So once you get that, you never misread it again. And he starts doing favors for her family. And a general who is guarding the front, the, the, the fortifications up in the Great Wall, starts feeling threatened because he's got rivalries with her family. And he thinks that she is talking Xuanzang into possibly demoting or in other ways punishing him. And so he leads his division of troops to the capital, burns part of the capital down. The emperor barely escapes with his concubine, and they, they rush him to safety as they flee. Other rebellions start popping up all over the place, and the Tang Dynasty almost falls at this place. But he is desperately begging the elites of different areas to back him. And they say, we will back you, but only if. Only if you give us some incentive to do that will we support you. And that incentive was basically, OK, I will, I will let you have more control over how you tax people. I will let you have, I, I, will, just, I, will, I will police you less, this sort of thing. And the reason it's called a tragedy is because as his troops are leading him out of the uh, capital city at night, and this is a, a subject of painting over and over and over, the tragedy of Yang Guifei, Y-A-N-G, Gui the concubine, G-U-I-F-E-I, -E Yang Guifei. He's leading this beautiful woman, or he's being led by his soldiers with this beautiful woman at his side. And his soldiers stop, and it's moonlit. You've got, to, you've got to have an imagination to study this stuff. You've got to picture how they dress, magnificent. The emperor can, is the only one who can wear yellow. The emperor is the only one who can have a dragon with five claws on his hand. Did you know that? Ritually. Only one person could have a five-clawed dragon. So when you see these dragons on any sort of costume or symbol or anything, the number of claws that the dragon has signifies the rank of the person. Just like you could not own, have more than eight dancers dancing for you unless you were the Joe King, this sort of thing, if you remember your Confucius. Um, and so they stop in, in front of a, or, or on the road alongside a Buddhist monastery under the moon, and the, and the soldiers say, Your Excellency, we will, not, we will not take you any farther. We will not continue trying to save you unless you let us punish this woman who brought this all down on us. 
who brought this all down on us? And he resists and on and on and on, but the, the end of the story is she's taken up into the, the trees outside of this Buddhist monastery on a moonlit night, and with a piece of a band of yellow silk, she's garroted, you know, put it around her neck and just choke her, and, and so the beautiful concubine Yang Guifei is killed. Xuanzong, a great emperor, but he just, he ruled too long. Um, the Communist Party has done something. They figured out, you know what, this like letting, let them rule until they die. If they become really old, that's kind of dangerous. And so they've actually made their dictators retire. There's a retirement age for their leaders. After Mao lived too long and did some questionable things as a really old man, after being a great young man, um, he was a great young man. You'll see this if you don't know this. Um, yeah, they were like, maybe we need to make these guys retire, because when you're 80, maybe you're just getting a little fuzzy up there. Um, you're no longer at the perfect 50-year-old brilliant stage of, like, Mr. Bro. Okay. Um, <laughs> and so he, re he, he retires. He, he, he abandons the throne. He's depressed. He loved this woman, and, and he's, um, his kingdom is to its knees. And so from this point on, because of his concessions, his, his agreements with all the people who saved the Tang Dynasty, the center, the capital, never controls the regions with the type of uh, efficiency that it could before. And so things just start turning into the pissed off peasants because they're paying too many taxes and mandate of heaven starts getting lost. Banditry starts breaking out after, seven, after the Anlushan Rebellion. And so it just declines until 907 when there is a revolt. I'll give you a couple of seconds, too. Do you have any questions at this point? Was there an aristocracy under the tongue? I try to avoid questions about that because that's a, I think 90% of the students, unfortunately, don't care. Um, and B, it's incredibly complicated. So the short answer is yes, because of the period of disunity when there was no central government and there were all of these northern and southern dynasties, yes, elite families, and, and because the Jin reestablished aristocracy instead of feudalism during the POD, there were aristocratic families. The Sui tried to do something about that with civil service examinations. Um, the Tang tried to do something about it too. But eventually, throughout Tai Zong's rule, the, 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 the Tang throne started saying, you know what, they support us, so who cares if they want to act like lords. Um, they didn't rule like lords. It was a centralized government. The last thing to say about the Tang Dynasty is that by the year uh, 842, Buddhism had become such a drain on the economy. There were 40,000, 40,000 Buddhist monasteries in China. And these aren't little monasteries, these are huge monasteries. Women who don't want to get married, women who are sick of being always subordinate to men, they love the idea of, I'm going to go to a monastery, shave my head, change my name, and pray, because we're a, we're a Buddhist civilization. The same with criminals, all sorts of people. The government at a certain point stopped liking this for some obvious reasons. If you're going and praying, what are you not doing if you're an able-bodied man? Working. Working. And in an agrarian civilization that has a very, very like, um, low ratio of arable land to population, we need, our, we need our farm laborers. We need our productive workers, not people who are just like, yeah, I'm producing. I'm praying to Buddha. No. That was the first problem they had with it. Economically, it was a drain. Second problem, it was not taxed. <laughs> Again, economically a drain. Third problem, they were filthy rich, these Buddhist monasteries, because they ended up like taking um, money from elites who wanted to, kind of like offshore um, banking accounts in the Cayman Islands today that elites used to avoid paying taxes to the government. The Buddhist monasteries served that purpose because they weren't taxed. They became banks. They started charging interest and all sorts of weird stuff. And so things got so out of hand, and the government really needed its revenues after the Anlushan Rebellion of 756, Anlushan Rebellion that we just talked about of 756. And so the government cracked down. They closed most of the monasteries. They made all the people in there who weren't working 
grow your damn hair back, cut the Buddhist name, monk name thing, and you get back to work. And that was, uh, and, and Buddhism never really, so they didn't outlaw Buddhism, they just really clamped down on it. And that was, the, that was the end of Buddhism as a major player in Chinese history. From that point on, it's just a, another folk religion. You go, you pray, you burn incense. Yeah. What does that word say under anti-Buddhist? Campaign. Sorry. So congratulations. We just did this, the Tang Dynasty in 30 minutes. If I finish in time, I'll show you some nice little clips from YouTube that I've assembled on the HOC YouTube channel. Um, yeah, we're doing all right. This little gap between 970 and, uh, 907 and 960 for about 60 years. There were a bunch of little, little kingdoms. They're called the, the Five Dynasties and the Ten Kingdoms, and you don't really need to know about it. All you need to know is that it took for like 50 years for one elite family, military family, elite family, to come out on top and claim the mandate, and everybody else is like, all right, you got it, you won. They don't elect, they fight. When a dynasty falls, there's not an election, let's elect a new emperor. There's some fighting that goes on until somebody comes out on top. It happens about every 300 years. Tong, 300 years. Look at the song, 300 years. So if you're unlucky enough to be born in about year 290 of a dynasty, you can just look forward to like dying on the battlefield because you're going to be fighting in, a, in some type of uh, war to determine who's the next emperor. Wait, what is that theory called again? It's called the Five Dynasties and the Ten Kingdoms. And, and it's just because none of them could like get it together. You know, hey, I'm the I'm the the later way dynasty. And three days later, no, you're not, right? This dynasty lasted three days. I'm exaggerating. But you notice five and ten, that's like fifteen different in fifty years, so it's not that far off. It's kinda of like the history of Singapore, right? There it is, fifty years. Um and the song, notice it's not a very, notice this is not a very long dip. Because here's the crash of wave three right here. And I tried to emphasize just how deep the crash was. This is just a little dip. But when the song is destroyed by the UN, poof, it's a major and instantaneous collapse. And this is one of the saddest things in world history, the end of the song. But we'll get to it. So what is the song? Let's see. Hey, that's pretty nice, actually. I can do that. Walter not paying attention anyway. He didn't care. 